Hello, friends, and welcome to How to Start a Business as a Cybersecurity Professional. Uh, this talk is for people who are looking to start their own business. They are, it's a talk for people who have their own business but want to get organized or are looking to grow. And it's for cybersecurity professionals who are just curious about all of the insanity that happens inside of the C-suite. Uh, punchline, it's not insanity. There's science behind it. Um, this is a re-recording of the B-Sides talk I gave in, uh, for B-Sides Greenville in 2020. And here we go. Well, I am ruggedly handsome, and I do quote my sources. So that's my wife. She thinks I'm pretty, and I believe her. Uh, I've been three years as the uh, scholar in residence for cybersecurity research at Clemson University. It means I worked with the MBA department and the, the MBAs to help with figuring out how cybersecurity and business work together. My goal was to have people who um, did business understand cybersecurity and the people who did cybersecurity understand business. And that basically gave me the platform I needed to write a bunch of books. Uh, two years as an entrepreneur residence at Clemson's MBA, acting entrepreneur in residence at the College of Charleston. And this is for digital transformation and cybersecurity that I'm helping those guys out with. 20 years in cyber, coached over 100 business owners, 17 years as an entrepreneur with one multi-million dollar exit. Yep, I sold my company. We'll get into it. But here's my favorite bullet point. Once upon a time, I was able to talk trash to the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize winner during a beach volleyball game on Richard Branson's Island. And if you guys tuned in on the live beach sides, uh, I actually gave more details about that story. It is one of my favorites in the world. It turns out people are just people and people are delightful. <laughs> which may be contrary to some of my cyber friends' uh, opinion. Anyway, all of this stuff starts with a call to adventure, meaning that the, the current world that you're living in gets disrupted in some form or fashion that makes you feel like, I need to change something. Um, something happened at work, something that happened personally, something has triggered you to want to change your current reality away from the employee-employer relationship and makes you curious, maybe I should start my own business. So let me kind of walk you through what mine was to give you an example. I was with IBM for a while and I was a road warrior and I had over 100% travel for three years straight. Um, one such point in time, uh, I was working with Lockheed Martin in the U.S. Air Force to stand up a uh, disaster recovery uh, identity and access management environment in Dayton, Ohio. So I was going back and forth from Montgomery, Alabama, Dayton, Ohio, Greenville, South Carolina, and I was doing that for a very, very long time. And one section here, one, one uh, um, layover that I went through was an 18 hour layover in Montgomery, Alabama. And I haven't been back. I'm sure the airport's nice now. But when I was there, about 17 years ago, it was under construction for refurbish. There was no bars. There were no, uh, no Wi-Fi, and uh, it was just, it was horrible. It was horrible, and I sent about 18 hours writing on a legal pad saying I'll never do this again for somebody else because at this point in time, uh, when I got home, my golden retriever would growl at me. Uh, at, the golden retriever even was so mad at me, it peed on my couch once. And guys, I have to tell you this. There's not a lot of tests that are as reliable as if your golden retriever doesn't like you anymore, you're doing life wrong. So I talked to a buddy of mine who was the uh, director of global security for a large corporation. And he said, hey, why don't you leave IBM, start your own company? Uh, you'll save me money, but you'll also, because I can pay you a lower rate than I pay an IBM, but I can also get you more money because you can take all that money home. So I thought, well, that's great, but I have a non-compete with IBM. I need to go talk to somebody to get permission. So I went to my manager and I said, hey, I know this is going to probably violate a non-compete, but I feel like I can take better care of the customer and I feel like I can blah, 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 give him all the reasons. And I was just expecting a big fight. <clears throat> Didn't happen. What he said was, oh, wow, I've always wanted to start my own company. I wish you good luck. So I did. 
But the fact that I started it isn't where I'm going to focus for the rest of the presentation. What I'm going to focus on is I'm really curious about that statement. I wish I could start a company, but I never have. So back to my story. Eventually, uh, 13 years after all that, um, a Dutch company purchased my company and I won the game. I went from one employee, being me, to 21 nerds doing identity and access management consulting and eventually was acquired by a Dutch company. So yay for Adam. But let's circle back to my manager. I always wanted to start a company. So we get it, right? We, there's a lot of reasons that people want to start companies. There's a lot of reasons that they give. Um, fine, right? But what they're really saying is they want freedom. They want freedom to be in charge of their time, their money, and have autonomy to work on the things that they want to work on and not be told what to do. So that's what I wanted, right? When I left IBM, I wanted to create a company that let me take care of my people and give them control over time, money, autonomy. I wanted to create a different kind of company, and that was my big driving force. So you don't want to run from something. If you run from the pain, the triggering event of being in that Montgomery, Alabama airport for 18 hours, eventually I won't be there and the pain will go away. You can use that triggering event to be the catalyst to move away from where you currently are, but if you're not running towards something with a cool vision, with a cool something, you're not going to have the fuel to get to where you want to go. So why didn't he do it? Why don't most of us do it? Everyone wants freedom. Everyone wants the things that were on those lists. But there's some real re good reasons that people don't. First one is they tell themselves that they don't have the time to do it or the security to do it. I had a friend saying, Adam, you're so lucky you started your businesses when you were young. I have kids. I just can't afford to take that risk. Or they see an opportunity, but they don't know if it's a real business and they don't know how to test to see if it's a real business. I got this idea, but I mean, I really don't know. Is it a thing? Should I do the thing? I don't know. And the last is, man, business is daunting. Uh, it is a lot of moving parts and we're going to get into them today, but it is a big, heavy lift to just try to help somebody in the form of a business. So I've got good news. One does not simply walk away from one's day job. The worst thing you can do is quit your day job to try to start a, a company. There's some caveats to that. If you already have customers who are trying to pay you, if you already have all those things, fine. But at the end of the day, what you really don't want to do is create more risk and more pressure by not having an income. I have a real good buddy and she was the director of online education for a major university. And she was globally known. People were flying her on their dime to lecture at conferences in Hawaii and all over the world. And I said, wow, you were, you've put so much effort into this and you just got more responsibility without more money. You must love this. And she said, no, I hate this. I hate this. I don't feel supported. I don't have the, I'm not living the life I want to live. And I was like, why don't you go do it yourself? And she gave me the, I don't have enough time. And I, and I said, all right, here we go. My suggestion to anyone who has that is don't quit your day job, but do give yourself 30 minutes a night, three nights a week to work on your business. And my bet to her, because I knew what she was trying to do and I knew the market, was I bet you that if you, give, if you do a, a, a 30 minute a night, and like skip one episode of whatever you're binge watching and work on your business instead, three nights a week, I bet you, you will be able to walk away from your day job in three months. And if you don't, I will give you $600 bottle, $600 bottle of scotch. Well, I didn't have to give her the scotch. She was out of her day job in a month and a half because things move quickly if you follow a system, if you understand what you're doing. And if they, even if you don't, you can go through and spend a year starting your business at night. Anyway, what I'm saying is don't walk away from your day job. Let's jump into some of the better questions here. What is a business? Why uh, should I start one and how do I do that? What is a business? A business is an engine that creates wealth. And that wealth and that engine drive a vehicle to a destination. So the business itself is not a destination. It is a machine that gives you power to do the things that you want to do. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just a machine. And that machine is made up of customers who have a problem that they need solved and you have a solution 
that you can then tell everybody about and then help them buy that solution from you so that you're sustainable and that they get what they need and they're supported through your operations of how you deliver your solutions and how you help them supported by your back office. This is all like the accounting and the finances and all the stuff, the inner workings of the company mixed with fuel and oil. So you got the engine, but it doesn't run without fuel. And if it is running, the whole engine breaks down without the oil. So the fuel is money and the oil are people. Guys, this is a business. Customers, problems, solution, marketing, sales, operation, back office, people, and money. And the money goes in and the money gets generated and comes out. And this is an amazing little tool. Uh, let's go and look a little bit deeper about how a business works. Revenue minus expenses equals profit. You need to generate profit because profit is money and money is fuel. If your business isn't generating profit, then the engine doesn't have gas to run and the whole thing shuts down and you don't drive anywhere. But let's dive into what these actually mean. And this is going to help you understand, even if you're not interested in starting your own company or uh, growing your own company, but just as a cybersecurity practitioner who wants to know how the insanity of the C-suite works, let me show you why all this stuff goes on. Revenue. You are selling a product or service to a customer. That is your vice president of sales. And that's your marketing department. All of these people are trying to generate revenue. Your expenses is the cost of producing those products and services and running the back office so that you can have the solution that you can actually sell. And profit is the controls that are put in place to manage those two uh, pipelines there, the revenue and the expense pipeline. Quota, that is the requirements that the chief financial officer puts on top of revenue, saying vice president of sales, uh, chief marketing officer, you must generate $100 each month, right? That is their quota. Go do that. And then they use budgets to control spending. Chief uh, operating officer, you are only allowed to spend $90 a month. And that way, the chief financial officer has guaranteed to the CEO that if everything goes according to plan, that the business will generate $10 a month. It's those controls that are most interesting to me because those are the, the, the things that make the engine run. And if you can understand quota and budget, revenue and expense, then you can see why cybersecurity is so important. If a breach happens, and the expense for production goes up. Let's say there is a, uh, a critical breach and someone's hit, the, uh, hit them with ransomware and they've locked everything down. And so now instead of being able to produce whatever they're trying to produce in the right amount of time, it takes longer and more expensive. Now all of a sudden, your expenses have shot through the roof. And now your revenue isn't there to support it and you have negative profit or losses. And if you have losses and you don't have enough fuel in the tank, the business will go out of business. The company will shut down. So cybersecurity is here to make sure that the controls that we put in place to allow revenue minus expense equals profit to work. We are the gatekeepers that make sure business systems function. And so if that's our job, we need to understand business systems, not just technology. So bravo for you for sitting through this. So what kind of businesses are there? Well, I classify them into three different ways. I am awesome, which is typically professional services. I can build it, means you can build a product. Or I know some people, which means you're a master networker and you can put different things together. Like, hey, you're a company who needs XYZ and I know a couple other companies that produce ABC. Let's get you all together. Um, I am awesome is typically where we all start. This is professional services. This is training. This is something that you do. You show up and you train an hour of your time for a hourly rate or for a retainer. These guys are usually self-employed, um, but it quickly moves on to where you can scale that. That is exactly what I did. I did I Am Awesome, Identity and Access Management Consulting. I trained uh, 21 other Identity and Access Management Consultants, and then I began to offer those professional services out there. So 
um, I can build it. That's when you actually create a software product, this or, or any other kind of product. But in my track record, I have done many software companies and these are very hard because as a professional services, I am awesome. If the customer gives you feedback, you can immediately change it. But if you're reselling somebody else's stuff, like I was reselling um, IBM software, and if the customer didn't like the software, there's nothing I can do. I only can script and code so much around the software to make it dance. But if the customer wants something different and the software doesn't do it, it's real hard to change that. And even if you're running your own software product, this can be a heavy lift. Um, I know some people. Those are the communities out there. There's a lot of ways. That, look, there's value in helping people know how to think about a thing and there's value in helping people find information about a thing and connecting those folks who need the information and have the problem together. Um, not a huge draw to most folks in cyber, but it does exist. So here's what I want you to know, whichever one you pick, our goal for you guys is freedom. What we want is freedom of time, freedom of money and autonomy on what you work on and when, on, when you work on it. it. That means that how you make your money needs to be independent on how you spend your time, which means you need to build the engine and let the engine run, not be a cog or a part of the engine, but rather you are the engineer, not the engine. When you're getting started, it's completely fine to be the engine. You'll fill all of those roles, all those uh, nine roles that I talked about, those are gonna be you. But you want to be in there with the intention of setting up systems so that you can walk away and do what you want. And if you really love one of those parts of the engine, feel free to do it. But that's, that's going to be a choice, not a requirement. You still have autonomy. So business works when you leverage these five things. You get the right people doing the right processes inside of the right systems, solving a problem that people care enough about that they're going to pay you money to fix. If all this is happening, boom, you got yourself a business. Then it's all a matter of getting the engine tuned and doing the right things. So let's ask this question then. Should I start a business? And I will give you a pretty good answer. This is maybe. Maybe you should. I used to believe entrepreneurship was a silver bullet. And then I realized that it is not the silver bullet. Um, it is very, very difficult. What I thought I was getting in for um, was a different kind of ride. It is not the way you're going to make the most amount of money. We entrepreneurs, we have high highs and lows, lows. We, the things that stress my family out the most is the unpredictability of entrepreneurship. Sometimes people say they live paycheck to paycheck, but an entrepreneur often uh, lives exit to exit. If the company doesn't do well, you don't have any insurances. The buck stops with you. But you also have control and you can roll up your sleeves. For me, it was far more risky to be a number on a giant IBM spreadsheet that some CFO somewhere can decide I was too expensive and I needed to be laid off. At least when I'm running the engine, I have control. I have the ability to get off my butt and make more phone calls to try to contact more people to find out if they have a problem I can help with. Um, so for me, the risk of doing nothing was greater than some of the risks of the uncontrolled, um, uh, not the uncontrolled, the, the unpredictability of entrepreneurship. But before you can do any of that, what you have to do is ans this, answer this question. What is the vision that you have for your future? If your vision for the future is compelling enough that you can deal with some of the stresses, that you can be resilient enough to go after that, then you should totally give it a shot. I absolutely agree with that. And if you do it in the right kind of way, it doesn't have to put you at a huge amount of risk. So I am going to narrow it down. I'm throwing away autonomy. I'm going to look at two things. We're going to look at time and money for when you have to do your vision because what I'm assuming and what I am positing to you is if you have control over your time and you have control over your money, then your autonomy comes naturally. Uh, that's a that's a pretty big a, uh, um, assumption, but um, you know that's just where I'm going to sit. And also, it helps this next graph because I don't want to put autonomy in here. Uh, although I guess I could uh, look. An employee trades their time for money. You show up and you um, do a thing, and someone pays you. So the more valuable the thing that you do to the company 
either you lower expenses by doing something amazing that makes it super efficient, or you increase revenue by creating a new product that someone can sell, or you help with uh, getting customers supported, things like that. So if you are providing value into that equation, then they give you more money. If they, if you don't put value into that equation and you're a commodity inside that, you get less money. So that's how an employee earns money. Self-employed are people who trade time and money and take some of the responsibility and risk in exchange for more money. These are your contractors. These are your general consultants who handle a lot of the back office stuff. Um, an employee, for example, and I'm going to use um, back of the napkin math, uh, an employee, when I am ca calculating how much they cost me, I take their salary times 0.15. That's all the fully burden rate for insurance, for um, travel for blah, 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 all the things, right? Training. The self-employed person doesn't get the benefits of that. And so when you're setting your self-employment, you have to make sure that you're getting paid at least 1.5% um, or 1.5 times more than what your salary is in order to have the same lifestyle. That is a risky thing. And so that's why people are like, ah, oh, well, you know, do I self-employ? Well, how do I do prices? That's important. Uh, and then business owner, they build systems that trade other people's time for money, meaning they build systems that employees can succeed in to produce value. And then here's the last one, uh, trades money for money. Guys, I'm not even going to talk about that one. I have no idea how to do that. I'm very bad at investing. Let's move on. Uh, I gave, uh, so we're talking about time and money. So I gave another talk at a, a earlier B-Sides about show me the money, how cybersecurity people make money. And I said there are three tracks, the technology track, the executive track, and the entrepreneur track. And I have to tell you, I've had a lot of conversations with some of my uh, drinking buddies who are now vice presidents inside of companies and ha ha, who would have thought, well done guys. Uh, but that's the thing is the executive track and the technology track, a senior technology person, they can make a whole lot of money with a lot less risk if you can win in that particular uh, track. Um, the entrepreneur track has a lot of chaos and most entrepreneurs I know make enough money that they are successful. These are lifetime on, uh, lifestyle entrepreneurs. Most entrepreneurs are not creating Google. Most entrepreneurs make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, have some freedom of time, have some autonomy and are very, very happy when things are going well. But there's an awful lot of stress that goes in that if you don't approach it in the right way. But I could not survive in the technology track and I could not survive in the executive track because I am programmed to be an entrepreneur. And maybe that is you too. So let's talk about if you choose to do the entrepreneur track and we talk about the engine, now you need to envision your vehicle. So if your vision was I want to help people and I want to do all this stuff and you're going to build yourself an ambulance, right? Or maybe what you wanted is to, hey, I'm, I'm going to help move this dirt around. Well, you're going to need a dump truck, right? And the engine you build for each one of these vehicles to accomplish your vision is different. A dump truck's engine will not serve Ricky Bobby in number 51 because he wants to be first because he knows if he's not, he's going to be last. And that engine just doesn't work. So as you discover your vision, your mission, what you're trying to get done, you can reverse engineer through design-based thinking what kind of engine you need to move that vehicle. Um, by the way, I absolutely love my last bullet point because I'm just picturing a clown car trying to save people's lives and like, you know, ER, uh, uh, EMT guys just pouring out of it. Anyway, uh, that was fun for me to imagine. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it too. All right. So let's get in the nuts and the bolts. How do I start my business? There are four phases for launching a business. It starts with ideation. What can I do? Let's come up with a whole bunch of ideas. All right, now that we've narrowed the ideas down from hundreds to a few, let's test them. All right, after we have validation from our tests that we've got the right thing, let's build it. And if you build it and you get a few customers who pay you, you have entered startup mode. And startup mode is the starting line. Think of all of this as training for a race. Um, this is all the prep work you do before you get into a game, right? So ideate, test, build, startup. 
let's go through them all. Ideation is uh, the process for coming up with business models, business ideas, and all of the things. You define the idea, you generate, uh, and you define your target, meaning what is my goal? Generate the ideas, a whole bunch of them, collect them, put them in a bucket, analyze them, and then act on the one you choose. So let's look at define. Define is getting extreme clarity on what your goal is. Uh, I, I love that pre a quote from President Santos of uh, Colombia said that if you do not have a destination port, your boat just sails around all the time and eventually sinks. So you have to have a goal in mind. Otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of energy, be very, very busy, but not produce anything of value. Um, and so having your target in mind is very, very important. And there's some good goal setting exercises I can help you guys with. But in general, it's how do you pick your goal and then how do you reverse engineer back? And now that you have a goal in mind, uh, for example, I had a goal. I want to make $30,000 a month. I only wanted to work 20 hours a week and I wanted to, uh, so, um, uh, spend more time traveling. So those were some of my goals. And now when I ideate a business around it, that's what I do. So we came up with all these ideas. Okay. You put all these ideas. What can I do? What can I do? Who can I help? What can I do? Boom, 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 boom. And you come up with as many possible ideas as you can, and then you organize them. Most of the time, you're going to notice a couple of themes come up, and you start organizing them around these themes. And then you need to analyze. Uh, I love this because idea, this, this uh, graphic here, you got Neo, and you've got all of these ideas coming his way. Boom, and he has to slow down in order to go fast. Before he can pick a bullet out of that whole mix, he has to slow all the ideas down. And so you're switching gears from this fast-paced ideation, idea generation, it's a whole lot of fun to slow down and let's go look at each and every one of these things. And what you do is you take some of the winners that obviously go, uh, that, that you resonate with, and you create a graph. And on one side, you have a bunch of rows that have all the ideas in it. And along the top columns, you have things you measure. How difficult is this to be? How expensive is this? Um, can I do it on my own? Can I do it at night? What's the next step? And so what you'll have is a whole bunch of really, really good ideas, but you're only going to have two, maybe three that match your goal and the time that you have, and the risk you're willing to adopt, and all these things. And I want you to be very comfortable with having a lot of really, really good ideas, but knowing that the constraints that you're currently under means that you're only gonna be able to approach a few of these. Keep the rest of them in your back pocket. Uh, cool thing about business is you can always launch more. Once the system is running, you can go play. And then you have to act and you have to choose. When you look at that matrix, <laughs> look at the matrix, I, look what I did there. That was unintentionally intentional. Um, once you look at your matrix, you'll be able to see that there are a few winners. And you'll pick one, maybe two, and then you will begin to truly act on it and analyze it. And this is how you're going to do that. After you pick one or two, you're going to create what we call a lean business canvas. And this lean business canvas is how you organize your ideas. You're going to define the customer who you're trying to help. You're going to outline the one to three, maybe a couple problems that they are experiencing that you think they need to have solved. You're going to list what they're currently doing that makes those problems, uh, that, that, that address those problems, right? Um, you're going to list a couple of solutions for each one of those problems. Uh, then you're going to say, hey, look, of these solutions, this is the unique value that I bring inside those solutions that makes me stand out. I'm going to come up with a cool metaphor. I am the this of that. I am the Uber of YouTube. I am the blah, 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 right? Uh, I am the Netflix of cyber karaoke, maybe, whatever that is. Uh, what's my unfair advantage? I had a buddy whose unfair advantage, uh, he was in a staffing agency, was he was married to the daughter of a vice president in a major corporation. And so that guy just bought all of his staffing needs from his son-in-law. That's an unfair advantage. And that is, it, it, is it ethical? Is it not? I don't know. Probably not. But at the end of the day, you have to have some kind of unfair advantage. It could be who you know. It can be your background. It can be all kinds of stuff. But in order for you to get started and get into the markets, there has to be some kind of unfair advantage. Uh, and don't worry, you have one. 
and you can discover it. A lot of us will be like, I got nothing. No, trust me. If you are breathing, you have an unfair advantage in some form or fashion that we can figure out. Then channels is all about how people want to buy from you. This is how do I tell my customers about my unique value proposition and about how I can solve their problems in a way that doesn't make them mad in a way that lets them know about it and then encourages them to take an action. And that action is to purchase one of our products based off of our solutions. That's your revenue streams. And then you have to understand how much does it cost to run all the parts of the company. Hey, guess what? None of this matters if you're, if you're not measuring it. What do they say? Uh, expect what you inspect. You have to come up with a list of key metrics that lets you know how all of these parts are running. Guess what that is, guys? That's your back office. Your back office is looking at all this. Boom. That's the same graphic done in a different way. The engine is organized and it makes sense, but you're still just doing this. You're building an engine, customers, problem, solution, marketing, sales, operations, back office, money, and people that will produce a result. This is what this might look like. Um, I'd like to put this up on a giant whiteboard, draw some lines and use sticky notes because you're going to make some assumptions and you're going to test them and you're going to be wrong. And then you're going to rip the sticky note off, boom, put it back on. This is an amazing tool because... This is a replacement to a business plan. You do not need a business plan at this point. Do not write a 20-page business plan with five-year projections. That's called creating writing. That should be in the English department, not in the business department. You don't know enough right now about your company to write a business plan. You need a lean canvas. So how do you understand if the stuff you put on the canvas works? Well, you have to test it. And that means you're going to go through and talk to people, potential customers with a problem interview. You're going to do data analysis on what they got. They, they give you the feedback. Then you're going to create a document that outlines your conclusions and go back to those same customers, potential customers, and say, I think I have a solution. Would you look at it? So the problem interview, I want you to go talk to 100 people. That is a kind of air quotes 100, but you need to talk to a large section of people, and I'll get into why that's important later, in order to understand, have you clearly defined the problem? Do you understand the existing alternatives? And what is the pain and what triggers it? So you want to know who has the pain and what triggers it. If it's a Chief Information Security Officer, CISO, has the pain of they're not able to do auditing uh, uh, in a timely manner. What triggers that pain? Well, the thing that triggers the pain is the fact that they don't have what they need in order to report to the CIO or brief the board of directors. And if that's what causes the pain, if that's what triggers the pain, you need to know that because then your solution has to say, look, not only can I complete these audits for you, but I can deliver them in a timely way that makes you look like a rock star in front of your board of directors. You see how that's a different uh, solution than I just do audits? No, no, I do audits in a timely fashion that makes you look like a rock star in front of the board of directors. So you will learn that by having conversations with people. Uh, after that, you take the data and you run through it. You review it, you define trends and insights, and you develop possible solutions. So this is another matrix that you put together that tracks all this stuff, and then you develop solutions. And look, you're, the reason that you're doing this is probably because you know a little something about what you're talking about. And so it's real important not to be biased about the solutions in your head, saying, well, I am really good at access management and identity management, so every problem is an LDAP problem or a portal problem or a whatever problem, and therefore my solutions. No, you need to be open-minded about this by this point. Um, and then you have to be honest with yourself. Can you create a solution or do you know somebody who can create the solution that meets these people's needs? And then you go back to them and say, hey, look, guys, here's a report. I talked to 100 people like you. Uh, I aggregated all of your information, and I created an industry report on problems, blah. Uh, here's my findings. By the way, these are the solutions I came up with. Uh, I believe these two or three are the best ones, but this one right here is my favorite. This is what I'm thinking about charging for it based off of what industries are doing, about industry standards. And when you're beginning to come up with a price for your solution, there's so many moving parts in this. You don't need to test pricing right now. What you need to do is charge what everybody else is already charging. If everybody in your industry is charging uh, $250 an hour for cyber auditing, and you're doing a cyber auditing company, 
charge $250 an hour. But for your early adopters, you can say, well, because you're helping me get started, I will reduce my price by 20% for you or something like that. But don't lead with that. Give them the price that they are expecting to pay because often you will bring risk into the market, into your, your customer if they underpay you because if something goes wrong and they don't pay enough, they're going to be held accountable. It's weird. It's very weird how this budget and quota stuff works, but um, don't try to figure it out. Just charge what everyone else is pay, uh, charging right now, as long as it fits into your um, business canvas. Uh, all right. So now you're going to build. You got customers who are like, hey, this is great. Uh, I do want that. But guess what? You talk to 100 of them and only 10 want it. And let's see, where is that? Yeah, only 10 want it. Because look at this. Customers, uh, there's psychology going on here. And not everybody in that 100, even if all 100 of them agree that those are the problems and your solution is absolutely the one that they need, only about 15 of them are going to buy, 15 or 16. Because the early majority, late majority, and laggards need more proof that you can do what you're going to do. These people buy IBM, Oracle, Big Box Shop. They do not take a risk on the boutique curated uh, security firm. That's your innovators and early adopters. And so what you could get is very, very depressed if you only get 15 people, or only get 10 people of the 100 that you interviewed to buy your product or service because you can say like, nobody wants this. No, you getting false negatives. If somebody in the late majority tells me I don't want, uh, tells me that they don't want my product or service, then I know it isn't that it's not my stuff is bad. It's just that I don't have a company with the reputation that makes it safe for them to buy from me because every single one of these people has to justify their decision to somebody else. So you are going to be hunting for your innovators and your early adopters. Um, right. So now you're going to deliver the solution and get feedback, but your solution is not perfect. At this point, your solution is probably not that great at all because we're doing a minimal viable product. Let's pretend that we know what the, the end product that we want them to have is a Jeep. And so what we do typically this is, all right, I'm going to sell you a Jeep. You need a Jeep. Your problem is transportation. I think a Jeep is exactly what you need. So I'm going to spend a couple months building a wheel, then the, the frame, and then da, 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 right? And at the end of the day, you get the Jeep. Well, let me tell you what happens when you do that. I had a company called Atlas Vault. We did cybersecurity um, compliance and reporting, self-assessments inside of uh, large uh, supply chains. So they did self-assessments, all this stuff. It was great. I spent $650,000 doing the top line. We built the database. We, we integrated with procurement software. We, uh, built the, we got the NIST assessments going, and we got the user interface. We were the turbo tax for uh, cyber compliance. It was delightful. Uh, no, it was a dumpster fire because by the time we were done with it, we created something that only worked for one customer and no one else wanted it. And I had to shut the company down after two years of development. Well, here's what a real MSP is. If the problem is transportation, there are a lot of right answers. And if you really ask the person what the problem is, it's like, well, I'm barefoot and I got to walk across hot asphalt. Well, you know what will help them? A skateboard. And you can build that fast. And then what you do is you test. Here's my first product. You said your problem was you don't want to burn your feet walking across hot asphalt. Here's a skateboard. You can roll across it. Great. Well, now I want you to picture a bunch of, you know, old people, old executives riding skateboards. It's, it's hilarious and dangerous. So what do we do? We tested and then we designed another product. And that was a, uh, like a razor that had like uh, handlebars. Great. Much better. The balancing is fixed. But now it turns out people are getting tired. So we build a bicycle with a seat. People get tired pedaling. Now we put a motor in it. And by the time you're done, you do get to a point in time when you have a Jeep that has a lot of people sitting inside that's protected from weather and all this stuff. But if I tried at the beginning, at the skateboard level, to create all of the infrastructure necessary to create a safe vehicle that was uh, approved and roadworthy and emissions and all of these other things, my company goes into the dumpster and I light it on fire. You have to to do small MVP, minimal viable product testing and development so you don't go out of business. If you are trying to start a travel company, a transportation company, 38 minutes a, a night, three nights a week, 
you can't build a Jeep, but you sure can build a skateboard. Right. So another little warning. This is about false positives and false negatives. Um, we had one customer who wanted the product. That was an early adopter. I thought that the entire market needed my product. They did not. I did not talk to a hundred CISOs about how they were handling um, transparency of cyber risk on their supply chain. And I wasted a bunch of money. So now you deliver the solution and it's very simple. You do the work in an amazing way. You get feedback and then you ask for referrals. And when you're doing the work, something will go wrong. You don't have a real customer until something goes wrong and then you fix it in a way that delights them right? We've all been on the call where someone complains or let's pretend um, uh, websites down and you get everybody on that big conference call and everyone's like, it's not DNS and it's not the firewall and it's not access management and it's not this, it's not WebSphere, it's not blah, blah, blah. Everyone gets on the phone saying who it isn't. If you're the one person who gets on the phone and say, I don't know who it is, but I'm going to look into this. I'm going to take responsibility from my side. I'm going to be a problem solver. I'm going to provide amazing customer service. When you pro provide amazing customer service, even if everything goes wrong, the people will love you. How you show up matters. Why you show up matters. How you help people matters. If you can show up, do the work, handle things when the things go wrong, and then you ask for referrals, those 10 customers you got from those 100 interviews will give you another customer. And again, and again, and eventually by asking for referrals from customers you have delighted, you will grow your company and you will have reached the startup. Yay, you've got the starting line. Yay, you did it. Congratulations. You are awesome and I am proud of you. This was a long journey, but you finally got to the starting line and you have a functioning company. And with those 10 customers who now became 20 customers or 30 customers, you have quit your day job and you are rocking and rolling. Whew. Good job. Uh, yeah, but guys, this stuff is complicated. Here's the emotional journey. The emotional journey on the right is my face showing how I have gone through all of this stuff. It is tough. So I want to find a way to help you guys. Um, I, it has been suggested to me that what I really need to do is create a workshop um, to kind of guide people along, share some of my experiences. Um, I'm going to do that. So I'm going to offer a workshop. Um, I, when I originally did the B-Sides talk, a lot of people raised their hands and we had about 122 people on the call. And, uh, you know, it turns out the early, the early adopters and the innovators raised their hand. I got about 10% to say, yes, they want the workshop. So I know 10% of the people listening to this are going to want a workshop. Um, it is still in MVP mode. So you go ahead and head to thecyberstartup.com, raise your hand that you want to be a part of this workshop, and then I will get you in to the system wherever we are with our MVP. Um, so the prices are going to vary. It's all going to be up in the air because I am actually doing what I just presented to you guys with this company. Uh, but I'm going to be completely transparent. So every step of the way, I'm going to show you guys what I'm doing. And so while you're going through the workshops and I'm teaching, uh, I'm also going to be sharing life lessons and we're going to be helping you get to the point where you have confidence in handling those three pain points of not enough time, not enough security, uh, not knowing if you actually have a thing that is real or not. And actually, hey, you know, it's business stuff is complicated, but now I have a framework and a format and I've got people to help me along the way. So head to cybersecurity. I'm sorry, head to the cyberstartup.com and uh, let's do this thing. I think what I'm building is the CISSP for cybersecurity entrepreneurship. I think that's my, uh, I think that's my tagline. Uh, I can't wait to hear if you agree. All right, guys. Thanks again.